Hello everybody, this is Professor Bruce Hartpence back with another networking video. Today we are talking about something that is near and dear to my heart and that is VLANs and trunks. These days it is tough to build a network of any size without spending some time on VLANs and trunks. This is chapter 4 in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching and I'll be taking a lot of the content right out of there and expanding some of the ideas a little bit here. So we're hitting the high points and without further delay, VLANs and trunks. When you build a network, it is fairly straightforward to put together a bunch of switches and heaven help you a bunch of hubs together and then give them outside connectivity with a router. So it's very, very straightforward. But as your network grows, you actually start to create a couple of problems. For one thing, it's what we call a layer two network. It's all switches, all the decisions are made with MAC addresses and the source address table on the switches. So we also call this a very flat structure if you were looking at it from the layers of our networking models. Ethernet broadcasts would traverse the entire uh, network topology. There would be no stopping a broadcast from end to end. And even if you're talking about IP version 6 networks that don't have broadcasts, Multicast traffic would travel almost the entire length of this network too, especially when we start getting into neighbor discovery and things like that. There would be very little security differences between the different switches. There would be no redundant pathways because if you put in loops, spanning tree would block them, or rapid spanning tree would block them, and while that was, there would be failover, it would be slow because you're dealing with spanning tree. And even if you're dealing with rapid spanning tree, you only have one link at a time. So there's no load balancing. Now if we take a look at the example of the broadcast domain. The broadcast domain uh, defined as the distance over which the broadcast frame will travel. And to be clear, we're talking about an Ethernet destination MAC address of all Fs. So let's say, for example, the first PC in this topology issues an ARP request. A broadcast of any kind, but we'll, we'll use ARP requests as our example. It hits the first switch there, and then that broadcast propagates throughout the entire topology. It's stopped, or the broadcast domain is bounded by the routers. But you can see that this one broadcast frame travels everywhere. Now imagine that all of those frames are ARPing for everybody else. Or they're doing DHCP requests, or Windows registrations, or multicast uh, sessions of any kind. And you can see that the traffic can really start to pile up. What do we do about it? Well, one significant solution that we have is VLANs. And what VLANs do, or the definition of a VLAN, is a logical grouping of nodes. Now, there are a couple of really important characteristics of a VLAN, and it can be a little tough to wrap your head around the first time you uh, try to understand what's going on, but we'll try and get you through a bunch of examples here. So it's a logical grouping of nodes, and it doesn't really matter where they are. A node on one particular switch can be in a VLAN or a logical group with another node on a completely different switch. It is one broadcast domain. What this means is that if I divide a switch up into VLANs, or a bunch of switches for that matter, Traffic generated on one particular VLAN does not cross into another VLAN. That's really important. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about unicast, multicast, or broadcast traffic. So this traffic does not cross the VLAN boundaries. Now, we think of VLANs as living at layer 2 because we configure them on switches. But you could just as easily say that VLANs live on layer 3 because... You have to route between them. You need a layer 3 device to go between them. And every node in a particular uh, VLAN has an IP address on the same network. So all of the nodes in a VLAN will belong to the same IP network or IP subnet. Now you have to think about your design a little bit here because you're looking at bandwidth, bandwidth utilization issues. So what this allows you to do is chop up a bunch of switches or an IP network into subnets based on the VLAN boundaries. Now, you may have been doing VLANs without ever realizing it. 
So we take a look at these two images. What I'm trying to show you here is what, how we think of our topologies and what the topologies actually are. So the image on the left just shows a switch in the center of a star topology with a bunch of nodes connected to it and then a router to get off site. But what you may not have known is that by default, all of those ports are actually in VLAN 1. Now we call this the management VLAN. By default, it is the native VLAN. This also means that it's untagged. Okay, so what's the big deal here? Well, it turns out that forwarding of frames is actually based on not just the destination and source ports and the MAC addresses, but also the VLAN membership. I'm showing you here the output of the source address table. So if you did a show MAC address table on a Cisco switch, you would see that not only does the source address table or the MAC address table contain ports and MAC addresses, but it also contains the VLAN. And this is another really important idea. So forwarding is not just based on port and MAC address, but also VLAN. So I mentioned that all of the nodes in a particular VLAN belong to an IP network or an IP subnet. So they all have the same IP prefix or the same network, network ID. This also means that to go between VLANs you need a router. So we stay away from addressing that has the same networks in different VLANs. That's a no-no. So we route between VLANs. Now if you have an external router, this also means that you have to ha assign the ports that are connected to that router to the correct VLANs. But today, we have multi-layer switches. And multi-layer switches have the ability, among other things, to route between VLANs. Now, multi-layer switching is actually much more than that. But for us, for right now, the nice thing about it is that you can have a single chassis, you build the VLANs, and you can route between them on the same box. So let's take a look at a couple of topologies here that are equivalent. If I took, let's start on the left, if I took a couple of switches and used those to connect my nodes to the network, and I decided that each switch would be a different IP network, I would need a router to go between them, as shown here on the left. But this is logically no different than taking a switch, dividing it up into two VLANs, as shown on the right, and then using a router to route between them. So another way to help you wrap your head around how a VLAN works is to think of VLANs as actually separate switches. Now the really nice thing is you don't need separate switches, but it's one way to help you understand the way that forwarding and how decisions are made. If we look again at the drawing on the left, there's no way for a packet to go between switch 1 and switch 2 without the help of that router. In the same way, packets cannot travel between the two VLANs shown in the diagram on the right without the help of the router. We have some more output for you here. These are the uh, command line outputs from show MAC address table and show VLAN. And again, we have VLANs, MAC addresses, and ports. Down below is the output of the show VLAN, and it shows you that by default we've got an awful lot of ports in VLAN 1. Now let's take another look at how we can put VLANs together. VLANs might be organized in a very straightforward fashion, as shown here on the left. Nodes on one floor are in one particular VLAN. Nodes on another floor are in another particular VLAN. But there's no indication of, of the offices or where these nodes are actually physically located. So if we start to look at where the nodes are actually connected, as shown on the right, we might find out that the nodes have nothing to do with an orderly set of connections to the switch. We can see that the numbers that I've inserted here indicate that the nodes can be connected to any port on the switch or switches and be assigned to a particular VLAN that will provide them connectivity to the right place and get them to their default router. 
let's talk a little bit about VLAN design considerations. Sometimes the VLAN boundaries are very straightforward. Nodes in a particular lab or conference room or set of cubicles that work together should be in the same VLAN. That might be very straightforward. Uh, wireless nodes all be in the same VLAN. But sometimes it's not as clear. So sometimes we have to examine the traffic. So what we're looking for is what is running on the network and who is talking to who. This means taking a look at your applications, network management, group commonality, things like security concerns, quality of service, are there VoIP phones here? These are the kinds of things that we're worried about. Now these 80-20 rule just refers to where your traffic is located. A lot of times we'll say that 80% of the traffic is local and 20% is going off-site. These days that changes to where now maybe 20% is on-site and 80% goes off-site. So how does that change your design parameters? Another consideration is whether or not your VLAN membership is going to be static or dynamic. When you assign a port to a particular VLAN, the port doesn't change its VLAN membership. So I take, if I take a port and put it in VLAN 45, it is in that VLAN until I change it. But that's not always how we want to configure VLAN membership. For example, in the cases of wireless or where we've got nodes moving around a little bit, you might say whoever connects to this port to have dynamic membership. So I might keep track of the MAC address, and when the MAC address moves to a different port, have that port automatically change to VLAN 45. Now this is not common. It's usual to have VLAN membership be very static. Well, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks for stopping by. Remember that we have been going through the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching Chapter 4, and next week we're going to do VLANs and Trunks Part 2. You can get more content at uh, BruceHartPence.com, and of course there's the other videos here on the channel. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destinations.